In this video, we'll talk about Empedocles. Empedocles of Acragas lives about the same time as the other two major philosophers we've been discussing, Heraclitus and Parmenides. Uh, in a sort of slogan form, we've said that for Heraclitus, everything's in flux or changing. For Parmenides, nothing changes. And for Empedocles, some things change while some things stay the same. Again, all of this is a sort of oversimplification for each thinker, but it'll give us a bit of context as we try to see how Empedocles engages with his contemporaries and predecessors. So in this video, we'll briefly introduce the city of Acragas, which is where Empedocles was a citizen, uh, some of his life uh, experiences and thought, and as we explore his ideas, we'll look again at some of the themes that have recurred again and again for us in the recent videos. For example, the distinction between appearance and reality, uh, and in the case of Empedocles, how he tries to develop a theory about reality as a real network of conserved elements and forces, which nonetheless generates all the varied appearances of human impression and opinion. We'll also look at his notion of the daimon, which in a way is the true core of human nature and part of our own immortality, that we are in fact immortal beings engaged in a cycle of life. So with Empedocles, we're going to travel west, uh, again, from Ionia to Italy and especially Sicily, quite close to where some of the philosophers we've been looking at recently are also based. So Parmenides and Zeno, as we saw, uh, studied and worked in Elia in mainland Italy, whereas Empedocles is based in Sicily, uh, in Acragas. Acragas is a, a beautiful place, which also uh, today boasts some of the best preserved Greek temples in the world, particularly of the Doric style of architecture. Uh, the Temple of Concord, so-called because we're not sure to whom it was dedicated, uh, here at the bottom right of the screen is a great example of this. It's very rare to see a temple so well preserved today. Uh, Acragas was also uh, one of these Greek colonies, in this case from nearby Gela, which was itself a colony from Rhodes and the island of Crete. It became one of the major cities of Magna Graecia, and it was located over the sea with a huge population, maybe over 200,000, maybe even more, uh, before the later 5th century BC. There's a remark attributed to Plato and also to Empedocles that the people of Acragas build houses like they're going to live forever, but dine as if they're going to die tomorrow. So that, in a way, reflects something of the perceived luxury and also artistic and productive ambition of the people of the city in the experience of near contemporaries. The Doric temples that I just showed you are in what's sometimes called the Valley of the Temples. So let's talk next about Empedocles himself. His name means uh, steadfast glory, Empedocles, which, as we will see as we go, might also be appropriate to his personality and his philosophy. He was a citizen of Acragas, who lived from about 494 to 434, so a, a bit of a later contemporary of Parmenides. He was born to a wealthy family, according to the biographical tradition, so there's a report that his father, Metone, won a victory in the 71st Olympiad, beginning in 496. There's stories about his studies with Pythagoreans, with Parmenides, with Xenophanes, so he was certainly engaged with this growing, burgeoning philosophical community in the region of Italy and Sicily. He was celebrated in his life for success in a lot of different domains, a real polymath, as we might say today, uh, as a physician or doctor, as an orator and politician, as a poet, as a magician. He supported uh, democratic causes in politics, at least we can infer that from one story, uh, and the equality of citizens. He used his wealth for interesting charitable purposes, and he also published advice to his friends, including uh, the poetry that we have today. He was also famous in his lifetime for achieving some seemingly quite miraculous things. He restored a woman to life after she'd stopped breathing. This is a report from Diogenes Laertius. Uh, he was seen to control the winds. He cured a plague by diverting and purifying water and so on. So achievements that in a way bridge reports of him as a scientist and as a wonder worker. And in a way, uh, he might have engaged with those traditions meaningfully. There's a story that he became a god that he himself may have encouraged. Uh, in, in his poem, he declares himself a god. Uh, he may have vanished later in his life. One story has it that he leapt into the deep fires of Mount Etna in Sicily, leaving behind only a bronze sandal. Uh, other stories have it that he simply withdrew quietly to Greece, to the Peloponnese, and was never seen again. So some of the biographers follow that story. 
but either way there was always the sense that there was something more than human about him. Uh, so here's a, a fun parallel to think about. Empedocles came across to people in his lifetime as a miracle worker in big purple robes, tall hat, long beard, bronze sandals. He was famous as a healer. He was known as a magician or a divinity on earth. He described his philosophy as a divine revelation. He tried to give his friends good advice on how to conduct their lives. He led his disciples around from city to city on great epic quests, and he vanished into the fires of a deep mountain and may have been immortal. That's right. As portrayed by Sir Ian McKellen, he might remind us a lot of Gandalf in J.R.R. Tolkien's Middle-Earth trilogy. In any case, uh, Empedocles was somewhat conscious of how this view of him developed. It seems like he intentionally, as a very capable poet, writer, orator, developed his image in a way that allowed him to share a new philosophical outlook with his contemporaries. Some of the views that we have preserved for Empedocles seem spiritual or religious in tone, though it's difficult to quite link up ancient and modern categories in this way. Some seem very scientific. Uh, and in fact, that distinction has seemed so strong to modern scholars that we've often imagined there were two different poems by Empedocles, one on nature and one called Purifications about immortality and reincarnation and the good life. But uh, we've learned more recently, actually, from a papyrus that was published just in 1999, so very recently by the standards of classical scholarship, that it's probably a single poem that reflects both of these kinds of views and unites them in one. So a little like in our discussion of the Pythagoreans, this apparent distinction can be resolved. Uh, so in fact, you can see a little of the Strasbourg papyrus here on screen, uh, and it's, it's an extraordinary discovery, and it shows that we keep learning new things about antiquity. Here's one of the passages from the poem. Friends who live in the great city on golden acragas, on the heights of the citadel, who care for good deeds, respectful havens for strangers, remembering that this being hospitable to strangers was almost always an important value to the Greeks. Uh, untouched by the bad, hail. I travel among you an immortal god, no longer subject to death. Ask to hear the voice of healing for all diseases. So why does Empedocles declare himself in this way? We'll see a little bit more as we get into his thought in more depth. Here's a little bit about what Empedocles thinks is real. And when I use real, we can think a little of how Parmenides uses this word as well. This is for Empedocles what at bedrock reality is really comprised of. Two constant forces first called love. And he often writing as a poet uses the mythic figure of Aphrodite to signal love. Aphrodite just is love and strife, for which he sometimes uses the image of Ares. He also speaks of these sometimes like attraction and repulsion, like fundamental physical forces. Then there's four constant elements or roots that are ungenerated, and these correspond to the four classical elements, fire, air, water, and earth. In a way, uh, we could say today, almost, uh, plasma, gas, liquid, and solid states of matter. Basically, these elements, themselves stable and conserved, mingle, interact, mix, and come apart again under the influence of the two fundamental forces of attraction and repulsion, or love and strife. And that gives us the kind of ordinary world that we experience, which constitutes a kind of mixture. Uh, animal beings, plants, the world we encounter around us. So if we connected this with uh, Parmenides or Heraclitus's thought, we could see that love, strife, fire, air, water, and earth these two forces and four elements are in a way what's real. They're conserved and in a sense unchanging. But their intermixture produces the appearance of all kinds of things coming into being and passing away and changing. But there's a sense in which that change can be called illusory because the elements and forces are the deeper reality. And this is a way that the appearance and reality distinction can be carried forward to um, even today recognizable theories of elements and forces. Uh, for Empedocles, this is embedded in a cyclic notion of the cosmos, the world cycles. In a way, it comes apart, it comes together, it comes apart, and it comes together again. Little like our notions of big bangs and big crunches. So for him, there's a stage of the world when everything is mingled together, that's the state of love. There's a stage of the world when everything is separated out, so only similar things are together and nothing different comes together, that's strife. And these cycle back and forth again. Where we find ourselves now, in a way, is in between. 
So it's true that these different forces, when we're beginning maximal love, that's just when maximal strife is coming in as a little force, and eventually we come back to maximal strife. And then love comes in as a little force, and we come back again to love. We're sort of in the middle of this pendulum swing. Uh, and if you compare Anaximander's idea that these um, things pay reparation to one another for their injustice according to the ordinance of time in that early, early fragment of Anaximander, it's sort of a, a similar notion that this back and forth occurs and repeats itself. One way we can see that we're in between is that we see some of the effects of strife and some of the effects of love. So strife is a force that will keep all the elements far apart from each other and with their kin. So for example, uh, there's lots of water in the ocean. And that, in fact, is a kind of relic, in Empedocles' view, of a state of strife, when all the water is off in one place, not mixing with anything else. We can still see some of that. But there's also lots of water in our bodies, mingling with solids and with air and, uh, and with fire, the heat in our bodies. So we're an exemplar of love, in that sense, at least in our embodiment. So there's some mingling as well as some separation, and thus we're in between these two states of maximal mingling or love and maximal separation. In a stage of the Golden Age, we can see there's a kind of ethical sensibility about this that picks up Hesiod's idea of the Golden Age too. In that ancient period, there was only Queen Cyprus, Aphrodite, love. No altar was drenched with slaughter. All were tame and kindly to human beings, so animals all worked together, friendliness burned bright in this state of peace. In a way, this picks up perhaps memories, if you think back to our discussion of palaces and poles, of the Minoan Bronze Age as imagined in some cultural memory in later Greece. It also picks up this image of the idealized Golden Age that we find in early Greek poets like Hesiod. So, a little bit about Empedocles' theory of knowledge, which we've also looked at with uh, Parmenides and with Heraclitus. He believes that knowledge flows from intelligence, and in a way like Heraclitus, he thinks that all of us have access to intelligence. At the same time, it's reasonable to talk of divine revelation, but that's not at odds with reasoning and inference from sense perception. So Empedocles can say some things that read to us a lot like uh, proto-scientific views, about attraction, repulsion, elements and forces, energy being conserved in a way. Uh, and partly because he has this insight into the way things really are, he can declare himself wise and a god. He can take up some of the language and descriptions that are often reserved for divine wisdom in the Greek tradition. So in this sense, there's a kind of unity of uh, divine wisdom and human inference or discovery or investigation. He also has a kind of naturalistic story to tell about how sensation works. So, for example, he suggests that on the ancient Greek principle, like knows like, because there's earth in us, we can know or apprehend earth. Because there's fire in us, we can apprehend fire. With love or attraction, we apprehend love or attraction, and so on. And he has a fairly worked out story about just how, for example, fire as light might enter the eyes and become available to our thought, which he situates in our blood. So there's a, an attempt to kind of explain and unite his thought as a doctor, uh, as a philosopher, as a metaphysician, and as a spiritual leader, uh, or someone who inspires people in this way. So it's very interesting to see how these different categories merge in Empedocles in ways that don't trouble his contemporaries, but might seem strange to us looking back from today. In addition, Empedocles suggests that human beings are immortal. We are daimons in a way in our real nature. Our bodies are mingled from the elements by love. Uh, the senses might deceive us into supposing that we grow and pass away, but really, we can return to our own natural state by a practice of nonviolence. Consider the influence here of the Pythagoreans encouraging vegetarianism and nonviolence as much as possible. For Empedocles, this is returning as near as possible to the original state of love. Uh, so, getting back to the Golden Age, in a sense, is something that's available to all of us returning to the ether and to the state of love through our actions and our thoughts. And in that state, we can find our own immortality. In context, it's interesting to compare Empedocles' thought with Parmenides and with Heraclitus. So there's an important set of agreements with Parmenides uh, in his basic insights. For example, in fragment 12, it's impossible to come into being from what in no way is, and it is not to be accomplished, it's unheard of, that what is perishes completely. So there's a kind of agreement here that real being doesn't end in time and is always. 
And when we really want to point at something or apprehend something with nous, it's real. There's also some agreement we could say with Heraclitus, uh, at least Heraclitus when he's being perceived and situated as an, an opponent in a way or an alternative to Parmenides with this thought that change is the constant. So there's an acceptance of change uh, in a certain way, even though the elements are a constant that are the same and the forces are a constant that are the same, nonetheless the elements never stop interchanging continually. In this way they're always unchanging in a cycle. So the cycle as a whole conserves everything, yet there is in a way change within the cycle. So this can be seen as a kind of compromise position that allows for this Eleatic notion of constancy, eternity, and being within which qualitative differences in motion or change can develop. We'll see that for hundreds of years thinkers are really engaged with trying to do this, trying to uh, fill in the space between Parmenides' compelling arguments about being and experience. Uh, Plato, for example, is often presented and, and sometimes represents himself as trying to bring both views into harmony or alignment. It's important to stress that for all these thinkers, though, except for a school we'll talk about later, the atomists, there's never a void or a vacuum. Everything is full. And that's part of why, everywhere you point, anything you think or conceive of is something. We cannot engage with nothing at all. So we'll close thinking about Empedocles with one quote. I've been born as a boy and a girl, he says, as a bush, a bird, and a fish from the sea. Because for him, we embrace within ourselves uh, all the elements and forces that there are. We are a microcosm. And in addition, we can conceive of ourselves as having been born again and again in almost every form in the world. But we also have a quest, a purpose. If you like, though, there's that sense of Eleatic being of all things together, uh, connected and constant, we have a project to try to achieve the state of love, which is our natural state, through nonviolence and through the kind of work on ourselves that Empedocles enjoins. So there's a definite ethical connection to Empedocles' thought as well. So in summary, we've talked a bit about the city of Acragas, how Empedocles developed his ideas, how he works out the distinction between apparent change and the reality of these basically conserved elements and forces, and how beneath all that, or above it all, or deepest in it all, human beings are daimons that are immortal.